So hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today. My name is Jana Weiss. Student Life Coordinator over at Coleman College. And together with the Tutoring Center, we put together recipes for success to help you succeed in your classes at HCC. Today, we're gonna to be talking about metacognition and developing strong learning strategies. Please welcome our two guest speakers, Amanda Guerrero and Juanita Martinez. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jana, for the introduction. And um, Juanita and I will go ahead and get started if we can move on to the next slide. So um, I'd like to preface our meeting today uh, with talking a little bit about metacognition and uh, what that means. There's really uh, no other way or simpler term to use for it, but it's how you know, sometimes in high school, sometimes in middle school, we have opportunities where our professors, our teachers have actually taught us different learning strategies. And uh, sometimes they have us do busy work and that busy work, we don't always connect the dots with what it is that they're trying to do, like memorization and um, doing vocabulary words or outlines and things of that nature. But what it what it comes down to is, is there are strategies on how to help us learn. And so what we're gonna talk about today are some various strategies that you might be able to put into place um, that will help you better learn, better remember information and uh, be successful in college. And in doing so, most of the, the content that we're pulling from um, has come from this particular um, text, as well as um, Sandra Yancey McGuire. So I do want to make it with Stephanie McGuire. So we want to make sure that we give credit where credit is due here. And we'll go from there. Okay, metacognition. What is that? It's the ability to think about your own thinking. Be consciously aware of yourself as a problem solver. Plan, monitor, evaluate, and control your mental processing. Am I understanding the material in my course or am I just memorizing it? Those are the type of questions you should be asking yourself while you're learning new material. Accurately judge your level of learning. Know what you know and what you don't know. So if you can you know, compare and contrast the two, this is how you're gonna develop some skills on recognizing, okay, I'm not learning this material, but I'm gonna to try to find ways and skills to help me build my learning skills. All right, so let's let's uh, let's do a little self-assessment here. You don't have to sh necessarily share your feedback, but I'd like you guys to take a, a a look at these particular questions and answer them on your own. So, what did you what what did most of your teachers in high school do the day before a test? What did they do during this particular activity? Would it be fair to say that the day before a test was typically when you guys would go over, say, a review that was distributed a few days prior to the test to kind of go over whatever questions that you might have to be preparing for that particular test? What grade would you have made on the test if you had gone to class only that day before the test? So that's kind of asking yourself, if you were only to, to see that information right before the test, how much of that might you have remembered and scored well on on that particular test? Will you succeed in your college level courses if you use the same strategy? Something I wanna share with you guys, we've done a lot of research on our students and what our students um, who come into tutoring more frequently and earlier in the semester um, do in their courses versus those who say wait until the end of the semester or closer to when the final exam uh, is given. And we find that those who come in more frequently and often tend to have higher success rates than those who wait. The same concept applies for how frequently and often you're covering content or looking at content for your particular class. So we're going to talk a little bit about this strategy because nine times out of 10, if you use the same strategy to just wait and cram everything until the last minute right before your exam, you're probably not going to do super well on that test. And we're really interested in talking a little bit more about this and what that would mean for you. How metacognition empowers. So here's an example of a student. 
your first year calculus student started off with some fairly low grades, 79, 54. So before metacognition, the student was probably just memorizing the formulas and using online homework problems or programs. So when they started using the techniques for, you know, um, metacognition and other learning strategies, they started to solve problems with no external aids, and they were testing the mastery of, of the concepts they were learning. And when they started to apply those type of strategies, their grades started to, you know, get a little higher, 90, 95, 90. So what type of strategies did the student use to become a better student? Effective homework strategies. So some of the things that the student would have done if we're looking at this holistically is they would have studied the materials first. So before looking at the problems and questions, they would look at their textbook, they would outline it, they would look at, we're going to talk a lot more about actually the details of what that might look like, but they would also review their, their class notes. Perhaps they would work example problems without looking at the solutions. So covering up the solutions just to see if they could solve it and follow the steps that the professor may have provided in the class until they get their answer right. And then check to see if, uh, if their steps aligned with what the steps were that were taught. If an answer was not correct, uh, figuring out where the mistake was made uh, without using any other individual or consulting the solution and then if they're not able to figure it out based on your notes, being able to use your resources. And what does that resource look like? Maybe you, um, you're struggling with a particular concept. You know that you're not getting it as, as, as frequently as you're trying to solve those problems on your own. So you hit up your professor during their office hours. That's what those office hours are designed to do. We, we hear a lot of students not understand that those office hours uh, that the professors offer are there so that the students can reach out to the professor and ask questions that they may not understand of what they may not understand of content. Um, use peer support. I know when I was going to college holistically before um, formalized uh, group study, uh, like supplemental instruction um, had had occurred, we would naturally just gravitate towards one another. And um, I remember for most of my math and science classes, we had a study group and we would coordinate when and where we would meet. Um, in between classes to make sure you never know when uh, one of your classmates may have understood or heard something differently than you did. And so you can help one another out. Um, and it also um, is really great because you're able to make connections with people as you progress through your degree program that you may have a lot in common with. Uh, we do have supplemental instruction in some of our courses, and that is a more formalized approach to study groups. And then tutoring, that's where we come into play. The academic success centers where, is where tutoring occurs. We'll talk a little bit more about how we tutor um, in, in a future slide. But another effective homework strategy would be to work your homework problems out and answer questions as if you were taking the test. So almost like quizzing yourself. Why is using the textbook so important? What word comes to mind when you see C underscore T? Would this word have come to you, your mind if you live in a culture that had no cats and you've never seen the word before? Our brains automatically fill in missing information if we're familiar with the content. It's the same thing with text messages. We know the acronyms. You know, we get used to typing that in and keying it in. It's just second nature for us. It's the same thing when you uh, continuously uh, go through your reading assignments and you start, you know, understanding the material, you start filling in the information. That's really going to help you um, understand what's going on in the course. Does your brain have the info to fill in what's missing in course notes? Will the test be written from what your brain or the professor brain sees in the course notes? It's very interesting. You know, a lot of times I, when I take a test, I always think, if I was a professor, what would I want my students to know? So kind of put yourself in that position. You know, what do I need to know? So as we're looking at our reading or our um, study strategies, we will also want to consider effective reading comprehension. 
Um, I don't know about you, but I know when I study or when I'm looking at material, if it's a topic that is not necessarily super interesting to me, often I'll read a paragraph and then I'll wonder what the heck I just read and then I'll reread it again. And sometimes that might happen three or four times before the material actually sets, right? So we do offer um, effective note-taking methods and that helps with, uh, as, as another um, recipe for success workshop, we advise that you attend that as well. But here are some effective reading comprehension techniques. When you're looking through your textbook, if you preview what you're about to read before you actually read it, and previewing is very simple. It's simply looking at each page as you progress, and you're just kind of taking a snapshot in your mind of, of bold um, titles, um, paragraph headers, maybe the pictures or the graphs on the sides of the page, and just kind of review, okay, overall, you have a general idea about what's getting ready to be covered before you actually dig deeper into that material. I actually advise that you do this before the information is about to be delivered in the classroom so that it's not your first time you're hearing the information in the classroom. You've actually previewed the material before you go. And then the instruction that's provided is going to fill in a lot of the gaps. Basically, you've got your your structure, right? Your bones there. And then you get into the classroom and all of the muscle and the organs start to come together there. Maybe the skin comes later when you study it. And then all of a sudden you have a complete picture of your study process, right? So read a paragraph at a time. I think it's important for you to take a look at what, what is that paragraph saying? If it's a textbook that you have no in, intention of returning, I did this often. I would take my pencil and I actually would write in the, um, right in the margins about what that paraphrased information might look like or in your notes, you could do the same thing. Um, you can use an outline method or a mind mapping type method and just kind of paraphrase, okay, this paragraph, what exactly did it mean and say? You can usually get the majority of that by looking at the first and the last sentence of the paragraph and any bold in between. And then use something called the SQ5R strategy. What does that stand for? Survey, question, read, recite, record or write, review and reflect. So when you survey, you look at the introduction of the um, particular chapter, look at the summary, look at the bold print, look at anything that's italicized. That's a survey, right? Question, so if you're going through, maybe you start to devise what questions that you think um, that once you read the chapter that that's actually gonna cover. Um, Another question is, what do I really need to take away from this particular paragraph? Or what do I really need to take away from this particular bold print word or italicized word, right? And then read one paragraph at a time. Summarize that paragraph in your own words. That's where the paraphrasing is. Record or write in the margins. I think I just mentioned that. I would do that all the time, but I, I wasn't really big on um, reselling my textbooks Back then, I was a little bit of a pack rat. Um, and then review. So summarize chapter uh, the chapter of information in your own words. So you summarize each paragraph. Now, overall, you've already read the summary. You may read the summary at the end of the, the chapter again. But what is it that the, the overall uh, content of that particular chapter is about? And then, and then reflect. And so when you go into the class and you have discussion, and a lot of times your professors are facilitating conversations, you can actually apply the information or see where that information has applied in life or in your workplace or whatever have you. You also get to hear from your fellow classmates about their views and kind of uh, bounce ideas off of each other. This sometimes happens in like ch chat discussions and online classes and things like that also gives you an opportunity to write out whatever remaining questions that you would have um, either before the class starts so you can ask them during the class or even at the end of your class as you progress forward of things that you may need to go back and read a little bit more on. These are very good strategies. I, li I like this because when you have um, sub uh, science subjects that have textbooks with long chapters, you really do need to form a strategy on how you're going to remember everything, everything that you read. You know, that's quite a bit when they include two or three chapters for one test and it's like, that's a lot of reading. Yes, it is. Um, but find a strategy that works for you. Developing your metacognitive uh, skills. What's the difference between studying and learning? 
Studying is memorizing and focusing on the what. It's kind of short term. You, you may forget that, with, with what you have learned. Learning is focusing on the how, whys, and what ifs, which promotes a better understanding of the material and applying what you learn. So learning leads towards more learning. So um, why do I need to know this? These are the type of questions you should be asking yourself as you're studying you know, your chapters, you know, you're reading through the chapters. What do I need to know? What do I need to learn? Can I teach this to a classmate? So here's a testimony. A first year student, um, I attended the supplemental instruction session and the exam reviews. Before the exam reviews and SI sessions, I would try to answer as many of the questions as possible to see where I was in terms of grasping the information. Then at the exam reviews, SI sessions, I would know what I needed to understand. Next, after the review or the SI session, I would go to my room and teach the material to my beta fish. The material I couldn't explain, I would study more. I would continue that cycle until I could explain everything in my notes. So that really does help for some people. Uh, I know that I find myself talking to uh, maybe a mirror and just reciting what I just learned, just to make sure I remembered what I just read or what I just studied. And it doesn't have to be a beta fish. It could be a teddy bear. Uh, <laughs> it could be your child, if they're willing to listen to you. <laughs> um, it could be um, you know, something in the room that you can focus on. Um, but the whole point is, is making sure that you're absorbing this information and you're able to you know, retract everything you just learned. Can you teach the material? So what we know about learning, learning in itself, um, active learning is more lasting than passive learning is. Passive learning, if you think about the word is an oxymoron, what is an oxymoron is when you put two words together, but they be the exact opposite, right? So learning is active, it's not passive. Um, thinking about thinking is really important. I think oftentimes we get caught up with the inertia of life and we don't really reflect about what is it that we're, we're thinking, you know, how do we think about how we think, right? That's what metacognition is. So it's so interesting to try to define metacognition or find another word for it. We just couldn't do it when we were trying to come up with, um, if you guys have any advice, by the way, drop it into the chat, but um, we definitely couldn't come up with that, but it's important to think about how do I think, how am I thinking? How am I working through a strategy when it comes to learning? And by the way, this is not just a strategy for being successful as a college student. This is a strategy that you can learn when it comes to being successful in your jobs after you graduate from HCC or from your bachelor's degree program or your master's if you're going along. It can be a strategy that you can use when it comes to doing things that you just want to develop on. It could be something like even religious studies, right? Anything that you need to learn in life. It could be, I don't know, I just recently took a Dave Ramsey program and I noticed that I was trying to do some of this at this financial peace university. Why? Because, you know, I want some financial peace. But anywho, um, using uh, metacognition and trying to understand and think about how I was thinking and how I was studying and how I was absorbing the information. And if I needed to go back and redo some of that was really important. So. I'm 43 years old. I'm still using these strategies in place and, and I finished a master's degree. So I'm, done, I'm pretty much done with my education. I, my boss is on the line. So he might say I'm not yet because I need to go and do a PhD, but we'll approach that a different day. But then the level at which learning occurs is important. So we're going to talk about something that might be a new concept to you. It's typically not new. If you're in the educational world, it's called Bloom's taxonomy. And um, Juanita, you want to go ahead and cover this one? <laughs> Okay, well, it's the level of learning. Um, and just like every pyramid, there's a base, there's a foundation, and it starts with remembering. So as we learn, uh, we can recall facts and basic concepts. Um, that's basically where all the memorization begins. And then it goes to the next level of understanding. Can you explain the ideas or concepts? You know, are you able to uh, report, select, and translate? And then it goes on to the next step of applying what you know. Uh, you can execute, ex uh, implement, solve, or demonstrate. This is where you kind of go into that teaching part, you know, where can I, you know, 
go over the material with you again and explain exactly what I just learned. Um, and then there's analyze, you know, you're gonna draw connections among ideas. Um, you know, this is where you're going to experiment, you're gonna question, you're gonna test what you know. Then it goes to the next level of evaluate. Um, and this is where you're going to, you know, um, argue the point or you're going to judge it or you're gonna value and critique it. This is where you really use your critical thinking skills. You know, everything I've just learned, how do I apply it and how do, is it going to be successful? Um, and then, you know, at the very top is create. This is where, you know, all the creativity begins of designing, assembling, and constructing, you know, and you're using everything you possibly learn uh, to create something. You know, this is probably where engineers and designers are, are thinking at. Um, but, you know, this is a very good concept to understand. This is something that we're sharing with you because we're going to ask you some questions as to, you know, what you think, what level you may be at. So we were wanting to pose this question. So at what level of blooms did you have to operate to make A's or B's in high school? So we want you to go ahead and input into the chat what you think the answer to this is. And we're giving you the six levels here. It's remembering at the very base level, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. So go back to the next slide, please. So if you could drop a, a one, two, three, four, five, or six into the chat, that would be wonderful. I'd like to see in high school, I think maybe three. That's what Amy had to say. Thank you, Amy, for your response. I know we have other students in the call, so please take a look at this question and put your responses in the chat. At what level did you have to operate at to make say A's or B's in high school? remembering information, understanding information, applying information, analyzing information. I would say two or three for me. <laughs> Was it? Mm -hmm. We'll put it in the chat, Juanita. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> two or three. <laughs> two or three. Next one. Next slide, please. So I would have to agree. It's probably a two or a three. Remember when you, you had to go through, write down your... Um, vocabulary words, you had to memorize your vocabulary words, you had to understand or um, memorize dates or scenarios in history classes or chemistry you know, formulas. Chem yeah, or the periodic table, understand it, all that good jazz, all of the um, symbols and things like that. Um, typically, what do you think uh, the level of blooms do you think you need to operate in to make say A's in college courses? So that's the other question, right? It's different than high school. We're not just focusing on remembering and, and, and understanding information, but what do you think? Is it three, four, five, six? Amy says at least a five, at least, at least five. evaluating. I yeah. I would say, I would say so. And in some classes, let's go back to the pyramid real quick. You see here. Um, so not only do you need to remember the information and you're doing a lot of the memorization on your own and understanding on your own when you're reading, right? Or when you're hearing the instruction, but then you've got to go back home and take that information you just learned and figure out how it applies. Sometimes group conversation and discussion, you guys can hash that out as well. But what when it comes to actually analyzing information and evaluating it, so asking, is this you know, whatever the concept, whatever the theory is, is this true or can it be something else? Perhaps it's something else. Um, I know in our interior design program, they actually make the students at the throughout their semester come up with different projects at the very end. And in a lot of capstone classes, you have to create a final project based on all of the previous projects that you had to work on. So you're creating an end product. In some cases, you might be actually making a piece of furniture or drafting out what a complete you know, plan might be that you would propose if you were trying to say, position a company to, to sell or gain uh, a customer in um, whatever it is that, that your business is. Um, it could be, uh, I know Interior Design does that in terms of like contracts for how they might reconstruct a building. Um, to see if they can gain again that project, right? So you get up into evaluating and creating when you're in high school. I mean, in, when you're in uh, college, 
it's the bottom levels when you're in high school. All right, let's move on. The study cycle. I really love this, this graph um, and I did uh, get permission to use it in our presentation. Um, it, uh, using the study cycle to get the most out of your in-class time and how to structure your out-of-class time when you're studying. So it begins with, um, let me see, start, there it is, preview, skim the material. Um, hopefully you read the material, but now you're gonna go back and skim it and take any notes of the main ideas and try to get the big picture of what it is that you're trying to study. Um, you're going to attend, go to class, take notes, ask questions. Um, you're gonna review by reading your notes, fill in the gaps, form questions. And then you go through this very extensive study process. And this is probably gonna be done during you know, your time or out of class time. So you know, be prepared to, to plan your time to, to, to set a specific goal on what you're going to cover and apply that goal, you know, study for 30 or 50 minutes and use effective study strategies. You know, the things that we're talking about today, you know, you can use mind maps, concept maps, um, you know, even if it's Roman numeral outlines, you know, whatever helps you, you know, in the note taking process. Um, remember to think critically by asking why, how, and what if. Remember, I had mentioned that earlier. Um, and then take a little break, step away, clear your mind. I know I do that with my projects. You know, it's just uh, so much is going into the project, you know, and, and how I want to deliver it and how I want to put it together. That sometimes it just kind of jumbles up a little bit. So I might step away, you know, take a walk, you know, um, get, a, get some water, you know, and then come back and then I'll try to reformulate what I was trying to do in the first place. And then have a recap of summarizing everything, you know, that you were, you know, covering. And then choose um, to continue studying, take a longer break, stay off the TV, <laughs> uh, or change tasks for subjects. So I know lots of students probably change tasks for subjects because they're probably taking multiple classes. So using your time effectively is going to be very important here during your studying time. So the next thing you're gonna do in this uh, uh, will is check, can I teach this? Um, have I mastered the information? Am I able to share this information and fully understand what I'm discussing? And then you start it all over again. So I, you know, if, I wish I can give this copy out more often, but you know, just kind of like take a screenshot if you can. <laughs> um, but I really feel that this is something that's gonna help a lot of people you know, um, trying to develop better studying habits. Um, yes, you do have to study for your courses, you know, uh, you do have to study for your tests and your quizzes. Um, that is something that's a given. All right. Um, so let's talk about your mindset. So there are different types of mindsets that we can have. And I do believe personally that having um, a certain mindset will either allow you to grow or it will prevent you from growing. So let's talk about that a little bit more. There, there are two main types that we're gonna talk about. Fixed. Fixed mindset is intelligence that's static. It stays put. You have a certain amount of it. It doesn't grow. An example, if you're thinking personally, I am not good at chemistry. And at this point, my grade for that class is reflecting that I am not good. All right, well, let's talk about a growth mindset. So that's flipping how we think about something and why this is just so very important because this impacts everything in life, right? The growth mindset, intelligence can be developed. It doesn't have to be static. You can grow it with actions. So here's an example. I ended up earning a 90 or an A in that course, but I started with a 60. I think what I did differently um, was I made side notes in each chapter. And as I progressed on to the next chapter, I was able to refer to these notes. I would say that in chemistry, everything builds from the previous topic. That's a small example. Um, if we go into anything and we have this mindset of defeat before we even give it a chance, we're going to probably end up with, with a negative outcome. But if we go into any opportunity, whether it be a course that we know going into it, maybe we have not had success in going through it in the past. Well, guess what? That could have been maybe your learning style and the instructor's teaching style didn't mesh well. It could be something that simple. 
right? So you have to go into these things thinking in your mind that, you know what, maybe I'm not, I haven't shown that I'm strong at these areas in these areas in the past, but that doesn't have to be how it's going to be. What can I do differently that is going to ensure that I'm going to get more out of this than I did the first time I gave it a go? Okay, another graph um, about the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. So on the left-hand side, you know, this is in a fixed mindset, you know, you avoid challenges, you give up easily, you see efforts as fruitless or worse, you may ignore um, useful negative feedback, um, you know, you don't want to hear the criticism, um, and you may feel threatened by the success of others. Um, as a result, they may plateau early and achieve less than their full potential. Now, on the growth mindset side, everything in a green, um, you know, these are folks that you know, embrace challenges, uh, persist in the face of setbacks. You know, they don't give up easily. They see efforts as a path to mastery, and they take they learn well from criticism uh, and find lessons and inspiration in the success of others. As a result, they reach even higher levels of achieve, achievement. Um, so this also gives them a greater sense of free will. So it's kind of like saying, have a positive mindset, a positive growth mindset, you know, that I can do this. So key takeaways, let's kind of just summarize and wrap some of this stuff up a little bit. So effective homework strategies, always solve problems without looking at the solution. That's one major key takeaway that we can do. Solve your problem without looking at what the solution is. Cover it up, do whatever you need to do. I used to take uh, these guys, your little post-it notes and cover it up. Sometimes I'd even cut it to the size that I knew that it would need to be to be able to cover it up. Um, and, and sometimes you'd have to do like two at a time because you could see through that first page. Uh, just an FYI. Uh, so effective reading comprehension skills. Let's talk about that. Memorize what you were told to memorize. Your faculty member, instructor, professor, they're not going to tell you to memorize something that's not going to be important on the test. And making a good grade on the test is not your end goal. Remember, making a, understanding the material that you're being taught is the end goal, right? But a byproduct of that is actually making a great grade on your test, which is always <laughs> wonderful to feel the benefits of um, having some sort of evaluation. That's what a grade is, right? An evaluation of what you learned. So ask yourself, what am I supposed to know after reading each chapter? What do you think the professor or the point of that particular chapter is? What do they want me to know? Develop uh, your metacognitive learning strategies. Codes. Can you summarize or teach what you've learned? You know, working uh, in the academic success centers for the number of years that I've been working here, I've worked with a lot of different tutors and also have um, observed a lot of different SI sessions. And what I can say is that our tutors and our SI leaders who are also students, they give us feedback all the time about how they knew the material and they knew the content of particular subjects before they actually became a tutor in it or else they wouldn't have became a tutor in it. But having to turn around and reteach it day in and day out solidified that information for them and made them that much more prepared and that much more ready for the bachelor and master's level courses that they go on to do. So we even have, I have at least two examples of tutors I've worked with over the last seven years who are in medical, one's in medical school, one's in pharma, pharma is uh, studying to be a pharmacy, a pharmacist. And both of them have said the exact same thing. So the importance of turning around and teaching information that you learn is really, really important. When you're looking at Bloom's taxonomy, aim for the higher order thinking skills, go for the top of that pyramid, study cycle, spend time working on your subjects every single day, even if it's only for 30 minutes. I, block, I like to block schedule. If it's not on the schedule, it typically doesn't happen. You probably heard my alarm go off just a few minutes ago. I tried to get it before you guys, but it was very distracting, but that was a block reminder of something that I know I need to take care of at one o'clock. So it was like, what, 30 minutes before one o'clock and I have a reminder going off on what I need to do. Come up with a good plan and execute the plan. Um, we gave you an example of the study cycle and at the end of the presentation, if you'd like for us to go back so you could take a picture, a screenshot or a picture with your phone, we're happy to do that. 
Attend your SI or tutoring sessions early and frequently. We already talked about getting help early and more frequently in the semester. One, it helps relieve your stress. Two, it helps relieve your, your meaning our students like to take their stress from cramming and not you know, necessarily doing all those activities they need to do on the front end and push that on to the SI leader or to the tutor. And that's not really fair to do to them either because they're there to help you, but they're there to help you from the beginning of the semester, not at the end only. Um, aim for that growth mindset. So kind of monitor your thoughts. If you know in your mind that something negative has, has come across your mind, I challenge you to just figure out how you can reframe that thought because you know once you reframe it into a positive thought instead of a negative one, that's going to ultimately determine the outcome for your particular situation. Don't go in defeated before you've even given it a chance. So these are a bunch of different strategies that you can use. You can use one, you can use two, you can use three, you can use them all. If you want to take a picture, take a picture. But I do, I do ask, what do you think would be your easiest? Maybe you're already using some of these things. Maybe you already have a growth mindset. Maybe you already have a, a good study cycle. What, what, if you could drop into the chat, which one do you think would be most impactful for you? That would be really good for us to know. Nothing. I know you guys are hearing us. I like using the growth mindset. Being positive, surrounding myself with folks who are like-minded. You know, they're as studious as I am and want to do well, like I want to do well. Um, that's very important to me. Um, but yeah, metacognitive um, learning strategies seem to help me with remembering the material. Can I teach it? You know, I, I do use that strategy using the mirror. <laughs> That's good. That's really good. I, I think can for, use my dog, but they, they don't pay attention very much. I think for me, it's probably more um, focusing on what the Bloom's taxonomy says. Like evaluating, evaluating is where I would spend some more time. It's challenging my thoughts and theories against others to make sure that you know we're really connecting the dots between unrelated things. Right. What about you, Jana? What do you like to use? I like the teaching method. If I can try to teach it to somebody or pretend like I'm trying to teach it to somebody, uh -huh. I really like that. In the study cycle, mm -hmm. if I'm going over it every day, it helps. Yes. Did you see that? I just took a picture of it. Why? Because I'm going to send it to my two teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, so let me just go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. Fail or not to fail? Top five reasons that a student might fail. They didn't spend enough time on the material. Uh, they started the homework late, did not memorize the information that they were asked to memorize. They didn't even use a textbook. Assumed to know material, but did not apply what was learned. Top five ways to avoid failing. Um, so do the preview review for every class. In other words, review your notes, You'd preview them and then review them at the end of class as well. Um, did homework a little at a time? That's kind of like what I like to do. I'll, I'll read um, a big portion of the chapter every night and then try to go back and remember everything I read. Um, use the book and use suggested problems, especially if the professor suggested certain ones, because that might be on the test. Um, use flashcards for memorizing information. Practice explaining the information to others. So are you committed to your own success? My guess is yes. I don't think that the individuals who are on this call <laughs> are on this call because they don't want to be successful. The fact that you guys are merely here says that you are committed to your success. So we commend you for that. Um, we certainly hope that you're getting a lot out of this presentation and we would love to hear your feedback. If you are, feel free to put that in the chat as well. I think that really fires Juanita and I up when it comes to understanding what our students are taking away from these kinds of sessions. Um, we do wanna to touch bases on just a couple of other things. HCC, uh, HCC we offer um, you know, the following counseling services. If you ever find yourself um, in a particular hard situation or um, 
maybe you're struggling with something internally or in your environment at home, we do want you guys to understand how you can get into contact with counseling. You definitely can go to the search feature and on the HCC website and type in the word counseling and it'll pop up and um, could be some, you know, we also have an ADA office with crisis counseling. We have a student success and retention department. Um, our counseling office also helps, thank you, Jana, with basic needs. What is a basic need? Um, it might be maybe you need access to some food resources or uh, hygiene or different things, basic needs, right? Um, next slide, please. Don't, don't be a, a stranger. If you need help, you have to speak up. That's the point. Okay, well, this is our tutoring flyer. And um, if you're not familiar with tutoring services at HCC, it, it's free to students. And we do offer virtual and on-campus face-to-face um, -face tutoring sessions. Our tutoring sessions are typically 30 minutes to possibly an hour. It just depends if the tutor is available for a full hour. Um, you can um, call that number at the bottom of the flyer, 713-718-8184. And you can speak to a call center representative who can help you schedule an appointment. So we recommend that you schedule an appointment to, to meet with a tutor just to guarantee that you can meet with them. Um, but if you happen to be on campus and you want to um, spend some time, you know, meeting with a tutor for a particular subject, you're more than welcome to visit our in-person locations. And if you go to our main tutoring homepage, hccs.edu forward slash tutoring, um, there is a category called in-person tutoring and it has all the locations and the room numbers and the buildings that the tutoring center is located in. So you can get more information about the locations from our website. Does anybody have any questions about how to get in contact with a tutor or how tutoring works? I know I put Juanita at the very beginning of the chat if everybody wants to go into the chat or um, you could do it right now. My best piece of advice for the students who are on, pull out your cell phones, go ahead and create a new contact, put tutoring HCC or HCC tutoring, however you wanna put it in there and add the telephone number into your phone. That way, if you don't have a flyer, you don't have access to the internet, you're going wherever you're going, you know, you're struggling, you can call that number and schedule an appointment. Um, it's best if you have it inside your phone, the device that you know that you probably very, very rarely lose. And um, then you don't have to worry about what did I do with that flyer? Or what did I do with that picture or whatever have you? Mm -hmm. Well, I have some students who usually ask me the question, well, if I take classes at Central, can I meet with a tutor at Katie? And I'm like, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as you're an ACC student, you can go to any of our locations for in-person tutoring or use our virtual service as well. Yeah, so it's really good to know even students who can't physically make it into the campus. If you're at home and you have access to, you know, Microsoft Teams, which you do through um, your student account 365 and, you know, a webcam and the material, you can always call the um, virtual call center and have a session from the convenience of your home. You don't physically have to come in if you don't um, feel comfortable doing that, or if you don't have transportation. Um, we're trying to make this as easy as possible for you to get the help that you need when you need it, and we're not charging for the services either. So out of everything that we've discussed, are there any additional questions, comments, anything? Amy, we appreciate your activeness in the chat. You're amazing. <laughs> We've never met in person, but we know your supervisor and we love her dearly. Students, hopefully when you registered for this workshop, if your faculty member professor had asked for you to do so to gain extra credit, uh, you indicated whether you wanted us to send a report over to your faculty member. If you do need um, us to send your attendance over and you may have answered no to that question, you can always send either Juanita, myself, or Jana, or George an email, and we'll make sure that your professor is notified that you attended the session. And if we don't have any questions, so we don't have any comments, I think we're pretty much wrapped up for the day. We're giving you guys... No. There is a question uh, I saw in the chat. The question was, how can we get the recording? Oh, that's a good question. Um, 
you're welcome to email either Jana or myself. And once the video is published, we can give you the link. It takes us a little bit of time after the session's over, but we'll definitely be happy to do that. Good question. Um, and Ms. Jenna did um, respond on the text just now. I said I will be uploading it on Student Live YouTube, okay. or I can send it to you. All right. Thank you. Well, I want to wish everyone the best of luck uh, in their courses. And, you know, just keep in mind that if you're struggling with any of your courses, don't hesitate to ask for help. That's very important. I think a lot of people feel reluctant to ask for help. Uh, we're here to help you. All right, you guys, thank you so much for your time today. And even more so that within the first week of the semester, you're already trying to establish these strategies. We have no procrastinators on the phone right now or on the line right now. That's right. <laughs> have a great semester. And um, we'll talk to you guys soon. Come to the next workshop if you found this to be helpful. Hi, thank everyone. You. Goodbye.